In 2013, Chinese leader Xi Jinping introduced the Belt and Road Initiative (BRI), positioning it as a central strategy for the Chinese Communist Party (CCP) to enhance its international influence by spreading its wealth around the world. The BRI is a global infrastructure development strategy to invest in more than 150 countries and international organizations. Recently, several major projects in Finland were exposed as incomplete, leaving behind deserted construction sites. In March 2019, Finest Bay Area Development (OI) announced an agreement with China's Touchstone Capital Partners for a financing memorandum of understanding valued at 15 billion euros. The CCP intended to participate in the construction of the world's longest underwater tunnel, the Gulf of Finland Tunnel. This tunnel was planned to connect Helsinki in Finland and Tallinn in Estonia. Touchstone Capital Partners, according to its official website, claims to be the sole funder, offering tailor-made, one-stop financial solutions for projects under the BRI. It has mobilized project funds amounting to approximately 30 billion U.S. dollars across Europe, CIS regions in Central Asia, Australia, Asia, and the U.S. Reuters estimates the tunnel's projected cost to be between 15 billion and 20 billion euros. However, four years later, the project has seen no advancement. In late August of this year, a Voice of America reporter, guided by the address on Google Maps, found a desolate area with no signs of tunnel development. According to Voice of America, in October 2017, a China-Europe train service deemed a significant BRI project by the Chinese government began operations between Kuvola, Finland, and Xi'an. Yet the Chinese government was reported to cover half of the train's freight charges, which drew the attention of Finnish businessmen. The CCP had hoped that this would bolster its influence in Europe. However, in February 2022, the outbreak of the Russia-Ukraine war disrupted the train service, with heightened tensions between Finland and Russia leading to both countries closing each other's consulates in July 2023. The success of this significant BRI project remains uncertain. While abandoned projects are concerning, multiple studies suggest that the BRI is causing participating countries debt crises. BRI projects have primarily spanned Europe, Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East. New York-based economic research firm Rhodium Group estimates that 25% of loans have gone bad. Additionally, 31% of BRI projects encountered problems during their implementation, including corruption scandals, violations of labor laws, environmental degradation, and public protests. A study released by Aid Data Lab at the College of William and Mary in September 2021 revealed that the BRI has added hidden debt amounting to $385 billion for dozens of middle and low-income countries. Over 40 countries have debts to Beijing surpassing 10% of their GDP. Reports indicate that in 2013, China surpassed Thailand to become the largest foreign investor in Laos. Investing approximately five billion dollars in 745 projects, Aid Data's research calculates that over an 18-year period, starting in 2000, Laos owes China a total debt of 12.2 billion dollars, which constitutes about 65 percent of its GDP. A joint report launched in March this year by the World Bank, Harvard Kennedy School, Aid Data at William and Mary, and the Kiel Institute for the World Economy indicated that from 2008 to 2021, the Chinese government financed a total of $240 billion to 22 developing countries to promote BRI infrastructure projects. However, as more and more recipient countries struggle to make timely loan repayments in recent years, Beijing is offering even more relief loans to these debt-stricken nations. A recent report highlights that nearly 80% of loans from 2016 to 2021 were offered to key developing countries, including Argentina, Mongolia, and Pakistan. A significant portion of these loans served as relief, assisting recipient countries in repaying their past debts, exacerbating their accumulating liabilities. Chinese construction companies often bid for government projects or directly approach local officials with potential projects, promising easy financing agreements from Chinese banks and insurance companies. Officials from developing countries have said this approach allows Chinese companies to gain a competitive edge, as governments eager to construct new dams or roads no longer need to raise capital independently, according to a 2021 document from the China Africa Research Initiative at John Hopkins University. Chinese firms accounted for over 60 percent of the revenue international contractors garnered in Africa in 2019. Critics argue that the ease with which Chinese enterprises secure loans from the Chinese government can lead to project cost inflations as governments face less pressure to economize. Furthermore, these aid projects have frequently faced complications, leading to soaring expenses for the recipient nations. For example, the Coca-Cola Sinclair hydroelectric plant 
constructed by China in Ecuador, faced scrutiny from engineers. Former Ecuadorian energy officials and congressional investigators revealed that the power plant's installed capacity of 1,500 megawatts was much higher than the initially envisioned 1,000 megawatts, surpassing the river's electricity-generating ability and resulting in escalating costs. According to the Wall Street Journal, Ecuador's national power company noted that since the plant's inauguration in 2016, over 17,000 cracks have been discovered in its eight turbines, allegedly due to substandard steel imported from China. In 2021, the company took the China Gajoba Group Corporation to an international arbitration court in Chile, demanding damage repairs. Any crack is unacceptable, the company stated in response to the Wall Street Journal's inquiries, these cracks could jeopardize the equipment's structural integrity, leading to collapses. The current Ecuadorian government, under Guillermo Lasso, has refused to formally take over the plant until these cracks are addressed. Utility officials have noted that multiple attempts to repair the cracks failed. Energy Minister Fernando Santos stated to local media last November, I will not accept this poorly constructed plant unless I am dead. Additionally, erosion of the river has resulted in escalating maintenance costs, Geologist Carolina Bernal, the National Polytechnic School in Quito, suggested that the government might need to relocate the plant's water intake to prevent structural erosion, costing millions of dollars. The Chinese Communist Party consistently denies the debt issues associated with the Belt and Road Initiative. On October 10th, the CCP released a white paper on the initiative claiming that no country has fallen into a debt crisis due to participating in the Belt and Road Cooperation. Davy Jun Huang, an economist based in the U.S., said that Beijing would never admit to the debt trap associated with the Belt and Road. They argue that these countries have inherently low profitability, poorer national incomes, and financial crises, insisting that these are fundamental reasons and not consequences of the Belt and Road. He said, some countries, in the face of a debt crisis, eventually mortgage local assets, such as mines and ports. They might feel that the utilization rate of ports and mines is not high for their countries, but for China, it might be more beneficial. Author and independent commentator Li Mianying stated that to solidify his authority, Xi Jinping is determined to push forward the Belt and Road projects he spearheads, never admitting any failures. So, if China's projects often lead to crises for nations, why do numerous countries still favor them? The answer is simple. Bribery. Ecuador is where the Belt and Road Initiative was spearheaded in Latin America. Data from the think tank Inter-American Dialogue indicates that apart from the much larger nations of Venezuela and Brazil, Ecuador has received more Chinese loans than any other country in the region. Following its sovereign debt default in 2008, then-President Rafael Correa turned to China's support to finance the country's burgeoning public expenditure. Throughout his tenure from 2007 to 2017, the left-leaning Korea, who often clashed with the U.S. and criticized multilateral lending institutions, secured a staggering $18 billion in loans from Chinese banks. Ecuadorian legislators, former government ministers, and anti-corruption activists have expressed concerns about these loans' lack of transparency. Contracts were awarded without public tenders, leading to subpar construction quality, inflated costs, and alleged corruption. Many current government officials and Ecuadorian economists suggest that some projects were ill-conceived, such as the development of Yache City in the Andes Valley, which was designed to transform Ecuador into a regional technological powerhouse. The China Export-Import Bank had funded the project's initial infrastructure with a $200 million loan. However, the once ambitious project has now been abandoned, and a $6.3 million supercomputer meant for researchers is left unused outside. In 2019, Ecuador's Comptroller General reviewed the construction of 200 schools built by China. The report found foundational issues in several school buildings, tilted classroom floors, and exposed wiring. The office stated that 87 of these schools were behind their completion schedules. In 2020, Correa was found guilty in a bribery case related to his party in exchange for government contracts. It's alleged that the former president is currently in exile in Belgium. Davy Jun Huang said that governments in these Belt and Road Partnership nations lack transparency. Officials, possibly having received benefits, might overlook damages to their citizens, leading to a lack of public condemnation against China. Li Mianying also remarked that China's approach in pushing the Belt and Road Initiative often involves using corruption to influence local officials. They might be aware of the problems, but having received benefits, they remain silent. Without a power and money exchange, the CCP wouldn't succeed, Li added.
Beyond the aforementioned hydroelectric station in Ecuador, shoddy construction, colloquially termed tofu drag projects, can be found globally. From a port in Pakistan, several roads in Ethiopia, to a transmission line in Brazil, numerous projects have been exposed for their flaws. Reports indicate that Pakistan shut down the Neelam Jelam hydropower station in 2022 due to detected cracks in a tunnel running through a mountain used to channel water to drive turbines. Tosi Faruqi, the head of Pakistan's Power Regulatory Authority, expressed concerns to the country's Senate in November 2022 about the potential collapse of the tunnel of the 969 megawatt hydropower station, which had only been in use for four years. Such a collapse would be catastrophic for a nation already grappling with rising energy costs. Since its closure in July of the previous year, the station has reportedly added approximately $44 million to Pakistan's monthly electricity costs. The World Bank has noted that hydropower stations typically have a lifespan of up to 100 years. The Uganda Electricity Generation Company, UEGC, has reported over 500 construction defects at the Isimba hydropower station on the Nile River, a 183 megawatt facility built by China. Since its inauguration in 2019, the station has faced numerous operational issues. The UEGC has highlighted concerns like leaks in the powerhouse roof situated directly above the generators and turbines. Funded chiefly by a $480 million loan from the Import Export Bank of China, the facility's construction amounted to $567.7 million. Another Chinese constructed dam, the Kuruma facility, located downstream on the Nile, was completed three years behind its initial schedule. UEGC stated issues with cables, switches, and the fire system, all installed by the Chinese contractor Sino Hydro Company, necessitating replacements. However, the Ugandan government has begun repaying the $1.44 billion loan acquired from the Export Import Bank of China for the project, even though the dam remains non operational. The Touchstone Fund announced a collaborative launch of a $10 billion Belt and Road Fund with Chinese state owned enterprises. The Silk Road Fund and financial partners, including Deutsche Bank, Commerce Bank, ICBC, the Export Import Bank of China, Bank of China, the National Development Bank, and Citic Bank. Strategic partners encompass major Chinese enterprises like China Communications Construction, Sonoma Energy Conservation, China State Construction, and China Railways. Some experts believe that the Belt and Road Initiative jeopardizes not just national economies, but poses a significant risk to universal values. Felix K. Chang, a senior researcher at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, in his September analysis titled China's Belt and Road Initiative More Political Than Economic, posited that the long term intentions behind the initiative might shift from economic to political. The Confucius Institute, a Chinese language program attached to overseas universities, is viewed as China's cultural weapon in the Belt and Road endeavor. Xu Lin, The chief executive of the Confucius Institute headquarters admitted in a BBC interview that the institute served to export CCP values, whether to institutions like Stanford University or local primary schools. During September's Asian summit, Chinese Premier Li Qiang announced plans to continue the Bridge to the Future China Asian Young Leaders Training Program and initiate a 10,000 people training and seminar program over the next three years. This aims to nurture 10,000 professionals in governance, anti corruption, and green development for Asian nations. Li Mianying commented on the CCP's evident intentions to embed itself into foreign politics. If you align with me, I'll nurture you and help you become president. It's a combination of economic and political maneuvers. Those involved in politics understand this. Davy Jun Huang observed that global universal values face substantial challenges, with Beijing attempting to redefine them through a community of shared human destiny. It's not just a straightforward debt crisis, he said. The entire national system faces significant challenges. The prevailing global values are under assault, and we may witness a reversal in the economic, political, and ideological realms. Several European nations are reconsidering their partnerships under the Belt and Road as China's international reputation wanes. Amid efforts in the West to reduce supply chain risks and heightened geopolitical tensions with Beijing, European countries are trying to decrease their dependence on China. Montenegro, after obtaining a $1 billion loan from China in 2014 for a new highway, has faced delays as the road remains unfinished. 
the debt accounted for over a third of Montenegro's annual budget at one point, potentially pushing the country toward bankruptcy until U.S. and European banks intervened with financing restructuring. At the Greek port of Piraeus, Chinese shipping company Costco Group acquired 67% of the facility. Critics argue that China failed to fulfill its $300 million investment pledge for port amenities, including cruise facility expansion, new passenger terminals, hotels, warehouses, and upgraded car import docks. In 2019, Italy became the only G7 member to join the Belt and Road Initiative. However, the promised benefits by Beijing haven't materialized, and Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney suggested last month during the G20 summit in New Delhi that Italy might exit the initiative later this year. The UK government has taken a more cautious stance on the Belt and Road in recent years, excluding Huawei from its 5G network in 2020. In November 2022, UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak declared in his first major foreign policy address that the so-called golden era of UK-China relations has ended. That month, the UK government also announced the exclusion of China General Nuclear Power Group from the Sizewell Sea Nuclear Power Plant project in England. On October 11th of this year, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Hua Chunying announced that the third Belt and Road International Cooperation Summit Forum would be held in Beijing from October 17th to 18th, with Xi Jinping delivering the opening speech. Given the historic challenges of debt traps, subpar construction, and cultural erosion faced by partnering countries, it remains to be seen if countries will still participate in China's Belt and Road.